All right. I was just checking. Made sure you have had the right coffee this morning. Um, so thankful that uh, to be back with you. Sorry I was uh, gone last week. Well, I was, I was here on the screen, but I was uh, not physically present. But it's good to be back, and uh, thank you for all of your prayers. My family, uh, we really appreciate uh, your prayers. Everybody seems to be doing much better. Um, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't, so, so there's that. But uh, thank you so much for all your prayers, and uh, thank you for all those who could make it, and thank you for all those who decided to make the wise choice and stay home and... Uh, uh, if you didn't get the message, we are going to do some snow angels out in the parking lot after service. So if you want to stick around and be part of that, uh, Elmer's going to lead the charge on that. So, uh, But uh, yeah, uh, good morning, Ritman Grace, and uh, it is good to be back with you. Uh, as I always say, my name is Clark, and if I haven't met you yet, I would love to meet you, and I'd love to meet your family uh, after service. So if you want to stick around in the lobby, uh, if we have met, I'd love to just catch up with you and see uh, what's been going on in your life. If you have to uh, start your car, heat that up and scrape it off a little bit, feel free to come back inside and love to chat with you. But um, I am excited because we're going to continue the current uh, sermon series that we have been in called Wise Up. Uh, we are actually in the middle of a six-week study in the book of Proverbs. So uh, we're at the uh, week three out of, out of the six weeks, so halfway there. And uh, here's basically uh, kind of the goal, uh, the purpose of this sermon series in a nutshell. Throughout this series, what we've been saying is that we want to be asking this question, what does it look like to live a life that is marked by wisdom? What does it look like to live a life that is marked by wisdom? Fortunately for us, we said the Bible actually has a lot to say about that uh, topic of wisdom, specifically in the book of Proverbs which is the book of the Bible we've been looking at. Uh, and we said this, you could think of this book of the Bible as theologically rooted common sense, basically. Uh, just good advice on how to live life. If you want to live a wise life, if you want to live a useful life, we said if you want to live a honorable life, then you're going to want to soak in and get to know the book of Proverbs. Get real familiar with this book of the Bible. Uh, last week, uh, you might remember we talked a little bit about the law of sowing and reaping, and we talked about the first character, uh, the fool. Uh, today we want to look at the next character, uh, the simple, or some of your Bibles might say uh, naive. I thought as a lead into today's message, I'd share my own uh, experience uh, being naive, a little bit gullible, and I apologize if you've heard this story before, but uh, basically, once upon a time, I was at home and I got an email from Pastor Bud, um, at least I thought it was, and he basically told me that he really, really needed me to pick up some Amazon gift cards as soon as possible. And uh, I remember at the end of the email, they said, God bless you. And I'm just like, whoa, like this does not sound like Pastor Bud, because usually he says I hate you at the end. No. <laughs> but uh, I just thought, that, sound, that doesn't sound like Pastor Bud, but, he's, but I emailed him back, and I'm like, I'm like is this something you want um, like, at the, you know, sometime in the next week or so? He's like, I'd really like it done today. <laughs> and I remember talking to Amanda, saying, like, I need to go do this. She's like, well, we had this thing. Do you really need to do that? I'm like, yeah, I mean, Pastor Bud never asked me to do anything. I really need to do this. So we got into, like, a little bit of an argument about that. I ended up going to... Uh, get these uh, Amazon gift cards. To, he wanted them to show appreciation to our volunteers. At least that's what the email said. So I drove to CVS Pharmacy, looked online. That was the closest place that had them. I went inside. I uh, got the amount of gift cards that he told me to get with the amount that he told me to put on them that I thought he told me to put on them. I get back out to my car and I look at the emails on my phone and uh, he says, okay, scratch off the back and send me the numbers. And that made me stop in my tracks, right? Okay, I can't believe I got that far, but that made me stop in my tracks, and I, I decided at that point that I would call Pastor Bud. So I, I call him, and uh, I say, hey, Pastor Bud, I, I, got those, uh, I got those gift cards that you wanted. And he said, oh, that's, that's good. What gift cards? And I was like, oh, my goodness. Well, you'll be relieved to know that we, we actually did up, end up using uh, those gift cards for, for volunteer appreciation. 
But the reason I tell you that is because that was uh, unfortunately a very naive uh, moment in my life. That was a, a little bit gullible moment that I uh, uh, got a little bit scammed, right? I remember my wife was teasing me about this. She's like, usually that doesn't happen to people that are 32 years old. <laughs> But I was like, well, it happened to me, so, so there. But uh, I tell you that because the next character we're going to be looking at is the simple, uh, the naive. And uh, I, I, I'm, I ha- maybe I just say this to comfort myself, but I'm, I'm convinced that I'm not the only person that something like that has happened to before. I think that happens to many of us. That's kind of our human experience. We tend to be naive and a little bit gullible sometimes. Uh, the 18th century Scottish philosopher Thomas Reed suggested that humans have a natural propensity to be trusting. Uh, he says this, the wise and the beneficent author of nature who intended that we should be social creatures and that we should receive the greatest and most important part of our knowledge by the information of others hath for these purposes implanted in our nature two principles that tally with each other. The first of these principles is a propensity to speak truth. The second is a disposition to confide in the veracity of others and to believe what they tell us. See, the point that Reed is making here, it's pretty simple. Uh, Human beings want to believe, want to be able to trust each other by and large. Uh, and that's good. Uh, we want to be able to trust people. I, want to, I wanted to be able to trust the uh, Pastor Bud, so I thought it was Pastor Bud, that I was emailing. Uh, but what the Bible is going to tell us, when, specifically when they describe this next character of the simple, the naive, they said to be careful with that, to be careful about that. Uh, here's what Proverbs says about that person. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 15 says, The simple believe anything but the prudent give thought to their steps. Uh, This proverb in particular is a really great introduction for what it means to be a simple or naive person. Uh, The word simple or naive is used 14 times in the book of Proverbs. And the Hebrew word literally means gullible. In other words, uh, easily swayed, easily persuaded, lacking in discernment. And according to uh, Old Testament scholar Bruce Waltke, Uh, He describes the simple this way. I quoted uh, this guy a couple times last week, but here's what he says about the simple. He says, The simple person is malleable, capable of being shaped. He can either be led or misled. So basically, the naive or simple person has not committed either to the path of wisdom or to the path of foolishness. They're sort of uh, untaught. They're unlearned, you could say. So as a result, they can either be led or they can be misled very easily. So to contrast uh, the simple with the fool that we talked about last week, uh, the fool, as we observed, is willfully or sinfully ignorant. The simple person, on the other hand, is naively ignorant. Uh, The fool, as we observed last week, is spiritually blind. They do not see things as they actually are. On the other hand, the simple person is spiritually short-sighted. Uh, we talked the very first week, you might remember, when we talked about wisdom being a spiritual depth perception. The simple person does not have that. Uh, they're not able to perceive the consequences of their actions and long-term effects of their choices. And as a result, it's not that they're spiritually blind, it's just that they're spiritually very short-sighted. They don't have the wisdom to see the end of their actions and their character. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 12 says, The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Now, why is it that the prudent, the prudent man could see evil and hide himself, and then the naive would simply proceed? It's because the prudent or wise man has that spiritual depth perception that we talked about. He or she has wisdom to see oh, this is an evil path, and I'm not going to walk this way. The naive lacks that, and therefore begins on that path and ends up in a place that they did not intend to go. They end up buying gift cards for somebody who doesn't exist. Last week, we said this, that a fool runs recklessly into sin. In other words, a fool is careless about sin. The simple stumbles naively into sin. 
They may not even intend to be going there, but their lack of spiritual depth perception causes them to end up there. Uh, This is why the book of Proverbs tells the simple to gain wisdom. This is why Proverbs calls to you if you are naive, if you are simple. It says, listen, apply yourself to learn wisdom because being simple is not in and of itself a sin. Being simple is not in and of itself a sin. It's not immoral to be simple, but it is unwise. Because being simple is in in and of itself is not a sin, but it can lead you into sin. Being simple can cause you to walk into a direction that you will end up in a place where you don't want to be. And it can cause sin, it can cause destruction in your life. Of course, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus redeems, Jesus restores, Jesus makes all things new. But the book of Proverbs warns us that naive decisions can take you to places that you never intended to be. So it could be very destructive. It could be very damaging. And the wisdom of Proverbs basically says, look, don't settle for being simple. Don't just compromise and say, I guess I'm just simple. Don't settle for being untaught and unlearned in the ways of wisdom. Learn and develop and cultivate a life of wisdom. Uh, Let me show you a story in the book of Proverbs, in fact, that helps drill down this idea a little bit further Uh, Last week, we looked at a couple different texts and verses in the book of Proverbs that talked about the fool. Uh, This week, I'd like us this morning just to learn by diving into one particular passage uh, where the writer describes a naive young man. So this is going to be in Proverbs chapter 7. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles, you can. Uh, We'll have the words up on the screen as well. Uh, Starting in verse 6. So Proverbs 7, verse 6, here's what it says. At the window of my house... I looked down through the lattice. I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. Okay, so so why? Because young men often lack sense. And I'll throw myself in that category. And some people might say 32 is not young, but I still think it is. But this is true to form. This is true to life. If you are a young man here this morning or watching online, Listen to me, I I love you. I want to see you grow up to be a godly, wise, mature man who is walking with Jesus Christ. Uh, But it's interesting, in the book of Proverbs, that oftentimes both the fool and the simple are coordinated with being young. And like I said, I'm throwing myself in that category too, so I'm not just beating up on on young people. Uh, In general, you could be young and wise. right? It's not impossible, but it's very, very common that simple person, uh, the simple person and the foolish person tend to be young. They're unlearned, they're untaught, and sometimes stubbornly and naively so. Um, in our culture in particular, it's, there's a, a prolonged adolescence that we see. that usually lasts until the age of 30. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of push and not a lot of momentum for men to grow up. And so again, uh, don't hear me the wrong way. If you're a young man, Uh, We love you. We want you to grow in maturity and wisdom. But like I said, it's interesting, specifically in Proverbs chapter 7, as Proverbs is going to lay out to us, it's talking about a young, naive man who is lacking sense. A young man who is not wise, who is not thoughtful, who is not godly. So let's read on, and we'll see what happens to this young man. In verse 8, it says this, He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house. At twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in, right? In other words, uh, this guy is in the wrong place at the wrong time. Verse 10, then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute with crafty intent. She's unruly, defiant, Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, at every corner she lurks. So in other words, uh, this woman is not naive. She knows what she's doing. Uh, There's an intent to find a man. Uh, This is uh, a man like this, this naive young man, uh, which, by the way, uh, this could also be a man trying to find ways to seduce a woman. So don't confuse the literary structure with the actual purpose and theology of what the text is saying. 
Verse 13, she took hold of him and kissed him. And with a brazen face, she said, today I fulfilled my vows and I have food for my fellowship offering at home. So I came out to meet you. I looked for you and I have found you. So notice how personal that is, how personalized. We just read about how she's lurking in the public square, but now she's saying, I came out to meet you. You're just the one that I was looking for. Verse 16, I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, cinnamon. Come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. So here's what is happening. This is a very discreet and biblical way of basically saying it's going to be a great time. It's going to be a great time. Let's indulge ourselves a little bit. It'll be great. I'll show you a really good time. Verse 19. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money, and he will not be home till full moon. In other words... There won't be any consequences, is basically what she's saying. We won't get caught. There's no chance of anything bad happening. Verse 21 says, with persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once, he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose, till an arrow pierces his liver like a bird darting into a snare little knowing it will cost him his life. Why? Well, because he's naive. He doesn't perceive where this is headed. Instead, he falls for the bait. He doesn't have the wisdom and the discernment to see, no, this isn't a place that I want to go. This is a woman that I don't want to get involved with. It's like a a deer, right? If you're you know, live here in Rittman, right? Um, or in Doylestown. It's like a deer wandering underneath a tree stand. Just naive. Not knowing that it's about to get stuck with an arrow. And get strung up and feel dressed and hauled in to be somebody's, right, a family in Rittman's dinner for the winter. That's exactly what this guy is like. He is naive. He's unengaged. And this is exactly why if you're simple, then you need to seek wisdom. Because if you're naive, what that means is this. It means that you're easy prey. Easy prey for sinners, for wicked people, and for those that would seek to bring destruction to you. Uh, You may not know that that's where you're headed. uh, But that's where that road is going to take you. And Proverbs calls you to wisdom. Proverbs chapter 8, if you flip the uh, Proverbs chapter 8, says this. Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? At the highest point along the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading into the city, notice, at the entrance, she cries aloud. In other words, what this is saying, all these metaphors or images of where she is uh, saying she's in public spaces. Wisdom is crying out to you at the, notice, the city entrance from the highest point. In other words, the wisdom of God is readily accessible and available. It's right here. God has not hidden his wisdom. If you're naive, if you're foolish, if you're immature, it's not hard to find out what God wants. Wisdom is making itself known. It's publicly available. Verse 4, To you, O people, I call out, I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple, gain prudence. You who are foolish, set your hearts on it. Uh, Look at Proverbs chapter 9 now. It says this, Wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants, and she calls Notice again, from the highest point of the city, see, it's public to anyone who will listen. Verse 4, let all those who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, come eat my food, drink the wine I have mixed, leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. 
You see, what's happening here is wisdom is calling you. If you're simple, if you are naive, if you lack wisdom, saying, turn in here. Learn. Become a student of wisdom. Specifically, the wisdom of God that is offered to you in Scripture. And this isn't just poetry here. This isn't just nice, poetic descriptions of wisdom calling from the heights of the city. This is God's plea to you. God is saying, turn to me, respond, learn in wisdom. Do not be content and remain simple, to remain naive, to remain young in your understanding. He says, turn here and learn wisdom. Okay, so having said that, how do you respond to that? In the book of Proverbs, it gives us this picture of a woman who is throwing a banquet and she is inviting anyone in the city who is willing and uh, wants to learn to come. But that's obviously some literary metaphor. So what does that mean for us? What might it look like for us to come under God's wisdom and learn? I think the way you respond to this uh, call to wisdom is by coming to Jesus. By learning from Jesus, by becoming a disciple and a student of Jesus, here at Ritman Grace Brethren Church, we believe the Bible is one divine story from Genesis to Revelation. It's all a unified revelation, God's word that has been given to us. So this call in the book of Proverbs, it doesn't stand in isolation. Rather, it stands in the course of God's history of making himself known to human beings. And so the call of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8, Proverbs chapter 9, it simply mirrors the very call that Jesus makes in the Gospels where he invites you to come and be his disciples. Uh, Where Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Follow me. Be my disciple. Learn my way of living. Learn my way of doing things. Come join me on mission. You know what a disciple is? It's a learner. That's what a disciple is. The word disciple in the biblical language means a learner. One who is coming under to learn, to submit to, to follow Jesus Christ as God. Lord and God. So the way that you become wise, if you're naive, if you're simple, the way that you gain wisdom is by becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. See, what happens often in American Christianity specifically is that we have put all of our emphasis on the conversion. Coming to Jesus in the first place, turning from our sin, embracing the gift, eternal life of forgiveness of sin that Jesus offers. Listen, don't misunderstand this. That's good and that's right, but that's the beginning point. That's the entrance of living a life as a disciple of Jesus. That whole part of discipleship has been oftentimes obscured, though. The message that we've been presented or have presented is basically looks a lot like, hey, who doesn't want to go to hell? Who doesn't want to go to hell? Do you want to go to heaven when you die? Okay, well, come and follow Jesus. But following Jesus is not merely about what happens later. It's about what happens now. That's what Jesus meant in John chapter 10 verse 10 where he says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy i have come that they may have life and have it to the full some translations say abundantly you see what jesus beckons us to is a life of discipleship an eternal kind of life that begins now but it starts with a completely different way of living and relating to the world and it means that you and i become disciples of jesus and we learn What does it look like to follow Jesus? What does it look like to live a life that glorifies Jesus? What does it look like uh, to reflect his goodness that that, that lives in his power and for his glory? Uh, That's why our purpose statement here at Ritman Grace, we we don't say it often enough, but we exist. Our purpose as a church is to follow God, to share his truth, and be examples of the love of Jesus to all. While we are here on earth, that's the life that Jesus calls us to. So uh, let me ask you this morning, are you a disciple of Jesus? Do you love 
Jesus? Do you want to learn from Jesus? Are you passionate about following, obeying, and being like Jesus? If the answer to that question is no, in other words, that's not your purpose, or you would say that is not my life's pursuit, then might I suggest that maybe you've misunderstood the gospel. Because the gospel is a call to come and follow Jesus. That's why in 1 John chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, this is a great description of what it looks like to follow Jesus. This is the English Standard Version. It says, By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. It's pretty straightforward. In other words, do you want to know if you are in Christ? Do you want to know if you are united by Jesus in faith? Then ask this question. Wrestle this question to the ground. Are you seeking to walk as he walked? Are you seeking to conform your life to pattern after Jesus in the way that he taught and lived and modeled? That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what it means to grow in wisdom. Now, having said that, there's a danger here. And the danger is that we will miss grace altogether. The mistake that we make here is we say, okay, Yes, I want to live like, talk like, act like, love like Jesus. So let me get started on that. Let me just try to live like Jesus this week, Pastor Clark. Okay. Well, that's a complete reversal of the gospel. Because the gospel is that you become like Jesus by grace through faith. First, you need to turn away from yourself. Turn away from your reliance on your own efforts and trust and rest in the grace of God. You come to a place where you say, actually, I'm incapable of living a life that pleases God. In fact, I'm really good at doing the opposite. So I need to receive, by faith, Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, and Jesus' righteousness credited to me by faith. So he pays the penalty for my sins, so that I rest not in my good works, but in his good works, in his sacrificial and atoning death for sin, Right? That's grace. But when that happens, uh, technically, it's before that happens, God, uh, he does something called regeneration. He regenerates you. He causes you to be, what the Bible says, born again. He gives you a new heart. He gives you a new inclination with new kinds of desires. And what the Bible says is that God sends his Holy Spirit to take residence in you. We did a whole series um, not a whole series, but we did a study in the book of Acts last year, and we talked a lot about the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit, the God of the universe, His Spirit is living inside of you. Think about how profound that is. I once heard a, a really helpful illustration. I'll totally butcher it. Won't do it as good as what he did, but uh, uh, Francis Chan did a really, really good illustration on the Holy Spirit once, and he said, uh, imagine somebody goes and plays basketball with their friends at school, and somebody says, hey, pass me the ball. I have the God of basketball living inside of me. They're like, oh, wow, we have to give him the ball. Um, and imagine that kid gets the ball, and he, every time he shoots, it's an air ball. Well, that would be kind of confusing, right? Well, it's almost the same way when we say we have the God of the universe living inside of us, and yet we're not living any differently. It looks a lot like a kid saying, I have the God of basketball living in me, but just shoots air balls. Here's the thing. Grace is not, it's not just saying, okay, I can sit back. Jesus died for my sins. Grace means that Jesus died for your sins and now God sends his Holy Spirit to live in you, to make you into a different kind of person, to allow you to live a life of discipleship, to begin to transform your character, to conform your desires to what Jesus wants, to what Jesus demanded, and to what Jesus commands, to live in light of the gospel. It means to be gripped by the grace of God. It means that you have come to the end of yourself, and that you have rested in, and you have hoped in only the grace of God to save you from your sin. And now that grace is working itself out in obedience, discipleship, and following Jesus. That's why the Apostle Paul says this in Philippians chapter 2. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Notice, for it is God who works in you 
to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So why should I work out my salvation? Because, it says it right there, it is God who is working in me by his grace to make me desire that, to long for that, to have the capacity for that and the power to actually do that. The gospel makes us learners. It's the grace of God that turns us into disciples. Now, I want to invite the band to come up, and, but as they're getting settled in, let me just close with this. Um, if you're here this morning and you say to yourself, I think I might be naive. I think I might be uh, simple, a little bit immature. The answer is to come and respond to the invitation of wisdom, which is really the same thing as coming and responding to the invitation of Jesus Christ, to come to him, to bow the knee, and to submit and to worship Christ, to receive the grace and the forgiveness that he alone offers and the power that he gives you to live a different life that is obedient to him, that is motivated and empowered by grace, that your life reflects the wisdom that is only found in Christ. So come to Jesus and learn wisdom. Let's pray together. Lord, we just uh, want to acknowledge that you, that wisdom comes from you, and that you are the ultimate source of wisdom. And God, we also just want to acknowledge um, what you're calling followers of Christ to be, Lord. Not just, it's not the gospel isn't just, hey, I get to get into heaven someday. I mean, that's of course part of it. But Lord, you call us to live a life of obedience and discipleship to you. And so Lord, help us not to lose sight of that calling as your followers. To, to follow you means to actually follow you. So Lord, forgive us for times where we have failed to see that calling and failed to embrace that calling. And forgive us for our inconsistencies of that path and, and walk with you. But God, at the same time, we, we thank you so much, God, for sending your son Jesus to die a sinner's death on the cross and to resurrect, to conquer, defeat Satan, sin, and death, to invite us into that amazing victory so that by the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us, God, taking residence in us, that we can live a life, a life that can only be empowered and motivated by your grace and by your spirit, Lord. Help us to press into your wisdom, God. Help us to press into what it means to follow you in discipleship, to be learners, to be students of wisdom by following you, by loving you, by wanting to, to share you with other people as we uh, go about our week, God. Help us to, to be a blessing to you and to bless the people we come into contact with. In Jesus' name, amen.